Uh, what is GRID? GRID is a global real estate community built for investors by investors, and we try to make investing accessible through association. This is the deal triangle. When all of you came in, I asked you to put on the color that you felt best represented your shortest path from networking to monetizing your network, <laughs> right? What are, you, what are you bringing to the table that you think is valuable where someone could do business with you? I'm going to quickly run through our sponsors. We've got Mike Capello with Sell Simply, who actually does have a deal right now uh, that he's trying to find a buyer for over in Front Royal. So if anybody wants to buy, uh, pick up another rental over there, he's got one that he just put out today. Uh, we've got our Coleman Bales. Let's get up here, buddy. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and Sweet. take it. Good to see everybody. Uh, you can I'm Coleman, um, residential mortgage lender and sponsor here of the uh, Grid Chapter. Um, Daniel and Matt run, so it's great to be here. A lot of you guys know me already, but the, those you don't, let's chat. Um, primarily doing primary residence, just regular residential lending. But I also do investment properties. If you've got a long-term rental that you want to finance, you do DSCR loans, you need to do it in an LLC or can't qualify that the income ratio-wise or something like that. Um, and an investor as well. I do flip a couple properties a year and have a couple rentals. So, um, you know, I think about things like an investor does. So, I'd love to chat with all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Woo. <clears throat> we've also got, uh, for your hard money needs, we've got uh, Simply Funded uh, with Sheree Warwick, uh, Home Pro Property, Ma Property Management with Thomas Price, and Casa Construction with Mark Beckett. And of course, for your realtor needs, uh, I am Dan Nice. Uh, my partner, Matt Magel, sends his regards. He would have been here, but he had to hop on a flight. There was a death in the family, and he had to get on the flight today in order to go to the funeral. So uh, if you would please include him in your prayers. Okay, we're gonna open up the day with our first and this time only breakout that we're gonna be doing. And this is just going to be three questions to help you practice monetizing your network. So with the people at your table, I'd like you to give a short elevator pitch, uh, an example of one way that you could try to extract this information from someone when you're networking is to say, what's the unique selling point that I should highlight you, um, so that I, that I should highlight to others about you, right? So for example, if um, I was talking to Mike Weber, uh, does anyone know what his brand is? Does anyone know Mike Weber or his brand? House hacking, right? He's the house hack king, right? So if there's a way that you could describe yourself really memorably like that, where you're really niched down, uh, that's a really good way to kind of uh, get more attention and more referrals. People know who is the best person to send your way. Brings up the second question, which is who is your ideal client or partner when I refer you business, right? Trying to really get clear on who is the ideal person you wanna work with and making that clear to the people you're networking with so that way they can send you the best referrals. And then finally, why haven't we done a deal yet, right? Under what conditions would you actually do business with the people at your table, right? So I'm just gonna turn on the music for a few minutes and I want you to just network with the people at your table and uh, maybe explore some of these questions. So how to maximize returns, mastering short and midterm rentals. Uh, important legal stuff, don't sue us, right? I'm just a guy like you. This is not legal or tax advice or any of that. All right, so we're gonna start with short-term rentals. So who benefits most? Typically, you're gonna be looking at any kind of frequent travelers, investors that are in high demand tourist areas. Uh, raise your hand if you think you could name a market that would be good for short-term rental that's nearby. DC. Okay, good, I heard DC, who else? Shenandoah. Yeah, in fact, let's just yell it out. Shenandoah, anything else that you think would be a good short-term rental market? Virginia Beach. Good. Could be, yep. Yep. Lake Anna. Lake Anna. Yep. Okay. So basically anything that you think would attract tourism, right? Um, now you can also do urban property owners, like we mentioned with DC, right? Those properties in popular cities uh, or vacation destinations. And of course, anything with flexible schedulers, investors who can manage frequent turnover with guest interactions, right? This last piece is more about you. This is the sort of person who's actually willing to take on uh, the demands, the time, can, the time demands of actually managing one of these, right? Because um, oftentimes when you're looking at finding a property management company, uh, they do ask for so much that it can really eat into your profit margin. So, okay. <clears throat> uh, some of the pros and cons when you're looking at a short-term rental. Some of the pros are that you're gonna be getting higher rental income, right? Obviously that's one of the things that we're the most excited about. Um, 
There's also some flexibility where you can adjust your pricing and your availability. So I know Matt with his, when he wants to just use his lake house, he just blocks off that time. He says, this lake house is mine. I'm going to go use it, <laughs> um, which can be nice. And then the increased exposure where you can list on platforms like Airbnb and VRBO, right? Uh, some of the cons, uh, there is going to be a high management demand uh, with such frequent guest turnover and high maintenance. You do need to build a business out of this. This is going to be a lot more labor intensive than a typical long-term rental would be. Uh, there are some regulatory risks where something that um, if you're not paying attention, you may buy uh, in an area where your intended use for the property is actually not allowed there. So you do need to pay attention to the regulations before you purchase. And then, of course, we have some seasonal variability where you need to have reserves going into this because you're going to make your whole year in a couple of months. <laughs> and then the other months, it's going to be a lot more struggle, all right? especially depending upon which market you are looking at. So you need to make sure that you have your reserves uh, prepared up front. OK? Let's stop there for a second. Let's do it. All right. I'm Eric Cavanaugh. I am a real estate agent. I, oh, I work with Dan on the Cause Group, and I focus solely on short-term rentals. I live in a little town called Berryville, out near Winchester, and between Leesburg and Winchester, so about an hour, hour and a half away from here. I cover the Shenandoah Valley. So I'm running Route 81 all the time between Winchester and, let's say, Massive Mountain. That's my market. Um, what Dan has got going on here is significantly true. Um, I'm going to start with the, um, the different types of properties. So in this book that you have right here, this person, she created the largest real estate short-term rental business in the country. Can you make sure this mic is on? This mic is working? At the bottom. Right here, switch. I, got, I don't know, I was just doing this. Yeah, you're good. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> so they own, that person owns the, uh, a company called The Short-Term Shop. They did 959 transactions last year, all short-term. Pretty awesome. Inside that book, the first thing you're going to look at is what market do you want to be in? And there are three in my book, or in her book. <laughs> There's regional, which is what Shenandoah is. There are destinations, Nashville, Orlando, Hawaii, things like that. And then there are um, things that are just a little bit more city-oriented, right? So that you can go to D.C. or whatever. That's where you get into the, the regulations really, really hard. For me, Shenandoah Valley, it's automatically 50% occupied. Automatic. If you're buying the right house, you will get 50% occupied. It's an hour and a half from DC, 66, straight shot. We are filled halfway each weekend, all the time, if you pick the right property. Right? Then it's up to me and my co-hosts and our managers to kind of fill in what we call orphan nights. What is an orphan night? Monday. Tuesday, stuff that doesn't really get anybody excited. But we, we change our strategy. So we look a couple weeks out to start with and say, okay, we're going to fill up the weekends. We know that it's coming in. So we're starting September already. All of our weekends are full. Come Friday, my co-host is on this the website looking at price labs, looking at what's going on around us. And then she says, okay, well, I don't have any bookings for Monday or Tuesday. I'm going to change my strategy from a two-night stay to a one-night stay, drop my price 10%, fill up the room. So we're running from 50% occupied when we got started to now that we know what we're doing to about 97%. So last month we had 27 out of 30 days and two of which we used for photos. That's great. Okay? Wow. So I'm that guy. What's break even? Break even. You know the 1% rule? That's break even. So if I buy a $300,000 house, I make three grand a month, that's break even. It's probably less than break even because your interest rates at eight and a half percent are not gonna make that work. To dig a little deeper, what occupancy, yearly occupancy is your break even? Is it the 50%? Yeah, 50% 50 is basically my, what I have to get, right? To get even close to my numbers. So um, I'm looking at 20% return. So if I can get on a $300,000 house, $60,000 in gross revenues a year, I'm doing really well. Okay? So that's the first thing. So pick your market. 
if you know that there's a high level of regulations like DC has, you can't buy one in Fairfax County because you're only allowed to short term rent it for 60 days out of the whole year. Right. But Old Town Alexandria, you can. So knowing your market, knowing what HOAs, knowing what county regulations there are up front is something that I've already investigated and I'm not gonna put you into a property even though it might be the most sexy property out there, I'm not gonna allow you to buy it because it won't do what it needs to do as uh, far as this is concerned. I've got a question. Sure. Have you ever thought about building a map for like a new client and you just give them a map of Northern Virginia and be like, here's the regulations. Fairfax, this is the rule. I have it. Um, I don't have it in a map, but I have all the, the county documents from the, the um, Board of Supervisors or whatever. Yeah, I have all that information. Yeah. As such a visual guy, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, I can give that to you. So um, that's the first step. The second step um, is, yes, I really want the higher um, nightly rates and things like that. So that we're talking to each investor about what to put into a property. Okay, if you're in the Shenandoah Valley in the mountains and you don't have a hot tub, you're off the map. Everybody has a hot tub. Everybody says it's a pain in the neck. I get it. But if you don't have one, you might as well not be there. It's significantly different as far as income is concerned. Okay. Um, then, um, yes, yeah, so we are talking about high management demand. So are you a hands-on investor or are you a hands-off investor? So I need to know that information going into it because some people just, they're a W-2 employee. They have high levels of income. They want to reserve some of their cash into what they call a cost seg. You can help them with that, right? If you've, you've had it in the past, right? But basically cost segregation is you're going to save on taxes, right? <clears throat> by, they're going to do that by managing it themselves. And then they may not want as much income in there. Then there's the second investor. I want a place that's going to be like Lake Anna where I can go visit and spend time with my family. And then there's the third type of investor like me. I want to make as much money as I can, right? So I need to know that before we even get out on the street buying a house. So know the regs, know what you're looking to do and where to go, right? So that's, that's how I start. Um, I'm not gonna let you buy anything that's not gonna work. There's a, ho a housing um, a community out in Front Royal right now called uh, High Knob. It's the most gorgeous property. It's 897,000. I can make 200 grand on that very easy, but High knob doesn't allow short-term rentals. It's like, ah, damn it. All right, um, seasonal variabil variability. I love that topic. So Shenandoah is a three season property, spring, summer, fall. Winter, maybe. If you do your pricing strategy correctly, you're gonna get a little bit less, but you're still pretty good. Um, if you're at a place like Bryce Resort, you ever heard of Bryce Resort? That's 12 season, 12 months, right? You're gonna get Mass and that's 12 months. They have ski resort stuff, right? You have indoor water parks, you have golf, golf in the summertime, there's mountain bike paths, there's all kinds of zip lines and things to do. So if you're into a 12 month and you want a consistent income, that's where you're gonna buy, right? So I already know this, I'm gonna tell you what's, what's what, and then we're gonna look at the numbers based on the property. Straightforward. Um, Anything else on this thing here? Oh, listing platform. So there's a couple of things with this. It's also a con. Airbnb has certain regulations. If you don't maintain a certain rating on Airbnb, they'll boot you off the system. So if you're planning your business on somebody else's platform, you're in trouble, right? If you screw up and you get over six months less than a 4.0 rating, they're gonna just kick you off the platform. Now your income is gone, right? So we really got to make sure that we're doing the right things inside the property, talking to guests the right way. So this is not just a, an investment business. This is a hospitality business. Okay. So you have to know a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to help you set up the Airbnb and VRBO, but I'm also going to help you get onto booking.com and probably other sites. We're also going to get you a off, what's it called? It's a management website, but basically, it's like hospitable, guesty, Logify, one of those websites where you can go in there, put all the calendars that you have. So you're gonna have Airbnb, VRBO, and booking all in one spot. And so if somebody books on Airbnb, then it's taken off of the other so that they know what's going on, right? That will also give you an its independent website. And so that you can get direct bookings 
and not have to pay the platform either. So we're going to help you set those up. Okay. Next slide. So uh, boosting your short-term rental business. Uh, some basic key strategies that you got to be pay paying attention to. Number one, optimizing your pricing. For this, it does make sense to have access to a bunch of dynamic pricing tools or at least one that you trust. You should be automating as much communication as you can to try to cut down on how much labor this is going to be. So streamlining certain aspects that are uh, reliable, repeatable is going to be important. Uh, some efficient cleaning, having reliable services and backups in case something was to happen because you do need to have a very clean Airbnb. Uh, enhancing the experience where you can personalize and simplify the check-in, right? Giving that personal touch can make a difference. And finally, leveraging reviews, especially if you are a platform dependent uh, marketing strategy where those reviews are going to, you know, make or break you. Yeah. So starting off at the top. So I use Price Labs. That's the only tool that I would use. Um, Airbnb has their own pr dynamic pricing tool, um, and there are others that are out there, but they're not as good as Price Labs. Basically, what Price Labs does is it analyzes the market that you're in. It looks at your comp competition around it, and then will raise and lower your price. You'll say your max and your minimum, and then it will figure out what the, the daily and rates should be, and then automatically set those based on what you've parameters have been put in, okay? So if you say my lowest is 150 a night and the next door neighbor is at 90, it's gonna give you a warning, but then you'll know if you're, why you're not booked, right? You also know if you got better amenities then you might get booked because you're a higher you know, quality property, okay? So things like hammocks, Outdoor lighting, hot tubs, barrel sauna, cold plunge, that's a new one, right? If you're out at Bryce Mountain and there's mountain bike paths around it, a bike wash. Like hot, um, what's the, the uh, little Pac-Man machines, like old school video games, right? Um, pool tables, ski ball, anything that you can do there. I have one guy that took a two-car garage detached and turned it into a game room, and it has a 1950s like jukebox in it. And so the theme that he's building around that is pretty cool, right? So um, automate your communication. So some of that is done through those websites, like Hospitable has its own AI tool. So if somebody comes in and they click on the button, it's gonna give them the, the address four hours or eight hours prior to you know, them actually showing up and it will give them the door code so that I don't even have to be in, involved, right? If they message me, I have the ability to click a button and AI will respond because it learns what we're doing along the way. Um, partnerships are always important, especially in investing. So I have cleaners, I have co-hosts, I have contractors. So Kaza Construction is one. I have SJ and his design pro business, right? Um, there's a lot of different opportunities for you to build relationships with people that know what they're doing. I'm sure you have a ton of contacts as far as construction is good, right? Yeah. Um, ex enhancing the experience. So the more you can add to a property, the better, right? You know that if you're only going to be a two bed, one bath property, you're going to sleep at maximum six people. Well, you're not going to get a table that's going to seat 10 people. Doesn't make sense. You're just inviting trouble. So you're going to maximize the property by giving it what it actually needs. Paint, wallpaper, light fixtures, Cool art, there's things like that that just really make it go. Um, and reviews. Again, if you're not getting a 4.0 or better, you're in trouble, right? Everybody wants a five, so we actually put a sticker on, on the door of the refrigerator that says, this is what a five means, right? We don't want anything less than that. And if we do get something less than that, then we know that we have to improve, right? So some of it's cleanly, cleanliness, some of its value, some of its location, actual house, stuff like that. So things that we can't control get people upset. We also are on a well. The one time we had a problem, <laughs> the actual, there's a mechanism that goes down inside the well that sucks the water out, actually fell into the silt and was pumping dirt through to the house and causing the towels and sheets and all that to be brown. Ladies standing in the shower and now dirt's falling out. No. <laughs> we got a good review out of that one though because we solved the problem. Yeah. So anyway, onward.
Uh, some common mistakes to avoid. Number one, underestimating the cost. You need to include all the different expenses. And if you're not sure what they are, you should be talking to other operators in your area that you plan to be operating in because uh, they'll be able to give you some insight there. Uh, some inadequate screening. You need to thoroughly vet your guests. It's important that you're not bringing in people that are going to trash your place. Uh, and of course, poor communication. You should, you should ensure that there is clear, prompt responses to everything. Leaving people on red is not a good business plan. Yeah, and that's one of the big things for, for Airbnb is if you don't respond to them within a certain amount of time, they will <laughs> kick you off the platform without even knowing what the hell happened. So. Um, Include all expenses. So I'm looking at when I buy the house, I'm already talking to the owner. What's your average utility bills? What's your water bill? What is the internet service that's provided here? Uh, all of the things so that I can give you that information up front. Because I, what I need you to do is basically, what is my break even nightly? So you got all your expenses, marketing, everything that you're putting together. What is my break even per night that I can go to? And that's where you set your floor right? And then you go from there with your price labs. Um, adequate screening. So there's different tools. You can say immediate book, right? Or you can have a conversation and look at the person and see what reviews the other owners have given them and decide if you want to keep them in your property or allow them to book your property, right? Um, poor communication. We just talked about that. Okay. So. And some unique strategies to consider to enhance your offering. Uh, number one, local experience packages. You could partner with a local business to offer some exclusive discounts or some experiences for your guests that could add value, promote your property, and basically make uh, the satisfaction of your people go way up, right? Uh, and then interactive welcome guides. You could provide a guide with local attractions and dining options and personalize it based upon the guest's interest to improve their stay and encourage positive reviews. Um, so I'm, I'm all about all of that. Um, so we do go out to the pizza place. We do go out to the local, you know, brewery or whatever, and let them know that we are here and we actually put flyers from them inside our property so that, you know, it's like a welcome center. They can go wherever they want to go. The interactive guide, we used to do that in a book, like flip page book. That's now obsolete in my book. So what I do is uh, I've got a little QR code that leads us to our website with a page. So that QR code leads to that direct page, things to do in the area, here's your discounts at certain places. All that shit is in, <laughs> all that information is in one spot. Okay, awesome. Um, before we move on to uh, midterm, is there any questions that we wanna talk about short term? Okay, cool. Great question. So three months of certain um, review numbers. Yeah. So you have to maintain a 4.8 or higher for three months in a row. And then there's another one called guest favorite, and that's just by, based on the number of bookings that you get each month. Now, how many properties are you managing right now? I'm not managing any. But I have two co-hosts. One is Kayla, who is Rob's executive assistant. She's managing ours for CASA. There's three. Um, she does a fantastic job. And then I have another partner who's actually a client of mine. His name's Corey D'Augustino. He's managing over 40 or 50 at this point. Okay, so your role is to find the properties? My job as the realtor, yeah. So I've created a, a little brand for myself. It's Stream, Short Term Rental Education and Acquisition. That's me, basically. I'm gonna do those parts and then I pass it off to Corey and others. Um, for that management piece. So let's team up. Okay. And buy properties there creatively. Great. Okay. Yeah. I don't, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. And by the way, what Corey does, he manages that many properties. You think it's like a lot of time? He's actually spending 30 hours maybe a week at most okay. for all of that. Yeah, yeah, so I know one right now, right for you, perfect. Okay. 1.135. If it's creative, why not? It's, it's absolutely creative. gorgeous. It's got a view. It's got 87 acres. You might be able to put glamping tents. Like you sure. don't have to. Glamping tents and all of that stuff. And then there's 14 community-owned lots at the bottom at the river where you can go and hang out. So it's a really cool spot in Strasbourg. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about more. we got more than that. but. 
anyway, as far as I'm concerned, I've been doing um, real estate since 2002. I got into Airbnbs during COVID. I, and then I actually moved closer to the market. I used to live in Percival. Now I live in Berryville, a little bit closer. Um, but it's just fun. The style of investing is fun. The houses are different. The, the properties, and being in the woods, you actually can see a bear here and there. You know, it's like, do you like the river? Do you like the mountain? Or, you know, what is the view that you want? And then we maximize it from there. So anyway, if it doesn't work short term wise, I then fall into her. Let's bring Jamie rentals. up. Jamie. Woo. All right. So <clears throat> I should have had this slide up to introduce you. <laughs> So okay. if you need his info, I have and cards, get it. we will talk later. Yeah. And here's Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, do you want to begin by introducing yourself? Hey, so um, my name is Jamie Banks. I'm a midterm rental operator, currently in three markets under contract for a fourth. Um, I don't necessarily recommend, but I am global to this area. I live in Virginia, and I'll talk a little bit about midterm rentals as I have a case study um, for parents of the property that I purchased. Now, do you want me to run through my slides first, or do you want to run through your story first? I get the story first. Story first? All right, let's hear your story. So, um, can you pull up? Yeah, do you want to come over here and help drive? Yeah. I know oh, you sent it. There it is. There it is, right at the bottom. All right, I'll let you drive. Uh, can we make it bigger? Yeah, if I go so. plus, 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 plus. Okay, yeah. There we go. So I like to run through the first. Can't hear um, her. As an incremental, it's just the different perspectives I thought of. And also the numbers on the property. So the biggest thing here is. Jamie, can you put this on? Sure. Both of them? This one's for the room. This one's for our online audience, which is usually just my mom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it. I'll let you put that you Okay, we good? Yep. Okay. So this is a two-bedroom, one-bathroom townhome in Philadelphia. Um, a lot of people ask why I chose Philadelphia, because Philadelphia is known for some unsavory things. Um, but mainly when looking at a midterm rental market, so one, everything um, that you Thanks heard about, about short-term rental Thanks. markets, you want to take into perspective. Out. Thanks because the regulations of a short-term rental market Good is to really going to dictate that mid-term rental market. And so, for instance, in Philadelphia, 30, day, um, 30 days or less is considered a short-term rental, which means that a mid-term rental is 31 days or more. And so I closed on this property, my husband and I, January 18th of last year, um, January 30th of last year of 2023, um, short-term rentals um, basically went through a huge regulation where you can only rent short-term rentals in Philadelphia um, if they're owner-occupied. And so essentially overnight, almost 30% of short-terms became mid-terms. Um, and so from that, that's why I like to say it's always important to consider the regulations to understand if you're going to be in a um, competitive environment. And so with the Philly property, I realized that I had to pivot. And so um, what I initially chose Philly because of education. Um, there are a lot of universities in Philly, UPenn, there's Drexel, there's Temple. And so I um, chose the market because of the educational travelers, right? You're going to have undergrads, which isn't necessarily who I like to run to, but you'll have grad students. Um, I've actually housed professors who were in town from um, the UK who needed some place to stay for the summer um, to teach at the university. Another, um, and one, one of the main drivers of midterm rentals that a lot of people um, hear is the medical industry. And so from there, you're going to get your travel medical professionals, that's your travel nurses, your travel lab techs, your different, your travel doctors, but it's also going to be your patients that are in recovery. And so um, I had a request want, once from someone whose child was unfortunately in the NICU, but they needed some place to stay for nine months while their child was undergoing treatment so that they were nearby. And so that's just an example of some of the types of travelers. And third, and probably the main one that I like to consider, especially to get higher rates, is corporate. 
And so with this property in particular, I pivoted from B to C, or business to com um, consumer. So um, not just listing on Airbnb, Furnish Finder, which are the main probably sites for midterm rentals, um, but running directly to businesses. And so in Philly, I was able to identify that there's a lot of old homes and a lot of row homes, um, similar to Baltimore, where just what it sounds like, there's multiple homes in a row. And so that presented an opportunity where insurance companies will need housing for their insured um, whose homes caught on fire or who flooded. And um, unfortunately, if one home catches on fire, all the homes in the row catch on fire. And so I have a tenant right now, and I'm, I'll break down my numbers in a minute, um, but that's like my current tenant who's in the property. His home caught on fire. He had his Christmas tree up and um, fell asleep, and it was seven homes in a row, and they all caught on fire. Everyone was okay, fortunately, but when ALE Solutions, um, which is one of the biggest company who does um, insurance relocation requests, when they contacted me, they had seven leads, and like, hey, we need housing for seven. I only had one, but that's just an example of like working business to business can do. Um, and so for this property, it was only 120000 It's definitely in a C area in Philly. Um, I'm in West Philadelphia, and it comes with its own connotation, but in an area that's right um, near the universities. And so a lot of times universities are in you know, the C areas, but walkable to um, UPenn and then also Drexel. Um, bought it as a second home, which um, my lender um, just required that I lived in it for 14 days. Me and my husband moved there for around a month to furnish it and get it up and ready. Um, those are my setup costs, about $15,000, so $12,000 to furnish. And I like to say that um, my furniture is very minimal. Um, like As you can see, these are real photos of the property. It's definitely um, furnished, I would say, good quality but low quality. I didn't invest a lot in rugs and furnishing because I knew that my ideal tenant was a traveler and wasn't a family or wasn't someone who was going to be home for too long. Um, and then from there, that's the rent I'm able to get for this property. My tenant's in there. He's been in there now well, since Christmas, so about nine months. They just extended another five months and because his home um, still isn't ready. Um, the long-term rent at this property, for reference, would be $1,100. So I'm able to get a little, time, a little over three times the long-term rent. Um, the actually tenant, the... Um, <laughs> go ahead. Great question. So um, one, I would say it's you have to have in mind your ideal tenant to be able, so when you're pricing it on these sites, you keep that pricing in mind. A lot of times people will price it, like I had the same property priced at 2000 and so if they contact me and they see it at 2000 it's hard to not honor that price unless it's, oh, it's five occupants, not two, or you know, there's pets, or a lot of times people get requests for, um, interesting animals, like I had a chicken request, a rabbit request. Um, I personally don't want chickens or rabbits in my home, but you know some people will for me. And so um, that's when, uh, when, one way you're able to, um, to negotiate for me. And like what I've done to set like the limit is there's a national price. It's called the GSA price. That basically that's like the price that the government like will pay per, um, per person per day for lodging. That is what I've used kind of as a top-end negotiation, meaning if they had to go and find, um, you know, another accommodation or even find like a hotel, right? Um, I like to find that, right? So like, let's say it's, a, you know, it's one person who's staying in a, let's say even a Super 8 would be $100 a day, let's assume me. Well, if we multiply that times three, that's $3,000 for a Super 8. And so one, I, I'm providing a much nicer accommodation than a Super 8. Also, there's, you know, they are able to cook or at a, you know, super aid or another type of accommodation, you're not able to do that. And so I use that as a negotiation point. But really, it's, I throw out a price and I see what happens. <laughs> um, so before this tenant, um, this was 35. The tenant before, I had 4,500, but it was two occupants. And so that's one thing I'm saying I'm able to negotiate where, hey, maybe like I have 3,500 is the price I have displayed, but how I'm negotiating it is saying, hey, this is the price for one occupant. Because with midterms, I'm paying for utilities and I'm paying for you know, additional wear and tear. One person being in my property is a lot different than two or three being in my property, sitting on my couch, you know, sleeping on the beds and using those items continuously. So I use that as a negotiation point. 
Um, I think for me, it's been really um, honing down on um, building a relationship with like relocation specialists. And so like with the Philly property, I'm able to get it, run it pretty quickly. And I, I also, I kind of like broker leads um, in Philly because I get so many because I have a specialist who, um, who comes to me with a lot of leads. Definitely. Mine probably, oh, go ahead. Just, just to tag him and you can answer this better than I can, but think about what she's saying, right? Who's paying the bill for these people to be there? First and foremost, if you're going for a burned down house, the insurance company is paying for that tenant to be in your property, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're talking about traveling nurses or doctors, the, the facility that they're in is paying for them to be there. So isn't really relative to the person unless it's further away from the property. Right now, the last one that kind of broke my heart is thing I never thought about it was the you know parents of sick children at a hospital. They're paying that bill, so you know then you might negotiate your rate down a little bit because you feel bad. It's not you know. Well, exactly, and then that's why for me it was going B to C is a hard part about midterm rentals is their furnish finder which um, if you've ever used Furnish Finder, isn't the most user-friendly site. And then there's Airbnb and Verbo, which are known as short-term rental sites. And so even if I'm Jamie on, you know, a certain, on Airbnb to find a midterm rental, Airbnb is showing me short-term rentals, right? And so that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, so especially reps that I already have a relationship with, I'll ask what the budget is. Sometimes they'll disclose it, sometimes they won't. Um, but like, for instance, like with this one, again, like I had 4,500 for my last tenant. It was the same rep, basically the person moved out. I took two weeks to get it, because um, they, had, they had messed up one of the, yeah, I was getting, yeah. Yeah, so I was getting more than this, but they told me that was the budget, right? And so I was like, okay, and then it was gonna be, they initially signed a six month lease, then it's, you know, it's been extended, so. So, so I, I, I used to have it in my head that short term was like the most, and midterm was a little less. This feels like it's even more. I would say it definitely depends on the market and the strategy, yeah. because like with insurance, I have a really good relationship with the rep, but if the rep was to leave the company, knock on wood, I'm, and the, if my tenant moves out in November, I'm probably gonna be vacant for three months. Mm -hmm. Especially with, with fire and flood, there isn't a way to necessarily to know. What's your typical vacancy right now? I, I would say on this one, because I've had it for about a, a year and a half, it's about 85% occupancy, so 15% vacancy. Pretty good. Um, Any time that I'm like, underwriting a property, like I'm looking at like, a new market I'm under contract for now, mm -hmm. I'm expecting three months mm -hmm. because if you're, there's another side of corporate or B2B, which is your corporate traveler, those are the exact opposite of insurance where they're planning in advance. So if you're working with a company who's bringing travelers to a market, they're doing it four, six, eight weeks in with advance, where insurance like this one, we moved him in in three days. So those are a lot faster, so I have to be vacant, essentially. What were the apps that you used for uh, B2B? So ALE Solutions is the largest site. Um, basically, I don't know the exact backslash, like the um, backslash, but when you go on the site, there's a link to register your housing. Yeah, and then it has register housing, and basically you put in the details of your home. It's not a listing platform, okay. so you're not uploading pictures. Even if it's, they also take unfurnished. The pricing isn't going to look right as nice because 
part of why um, you're able to charge more is because for furnishing, but that's something to keep in mind. I've seen people who had a home who was like, hey, maybe I'm between tenants, maybe they're in a market where they no longer want to rent long term, which happens a lot in Philly, and so they're just listing those long, those unfurnished properties, but renting them midterm, and then the insurance company brings in the furniture. You can't, and I think that's why, it, well exactly, and then like, I like looking at the, the government rate just because it gives a great picture, because then if they're, like let's say Motel 6 or Hilton Garden Inn, you know, we're stepping up, but even those, if you don't have a kitchen, you still have to be provided with a per diem, because you have to eat, and so then you're multiplying that, and of course you can't find that even in Philadelphia or in a cheaper market, let alone in Northern Virginia, um, you can't find that rate. And then one thing I went after, this home is about 800 square feet of livable space. I have some unfinished basement, but um, I went for two bedrooms even though it's on the smaller side because of that second bedroom. I don't suggest going or buying a midterm just as a one bed because if you think about it, the alternative would just be an extended stay hotel. If it's one individual person who's maybe there for a long-term stay, you know, and their company's paying, the company might just go to residence in because it's easier. Where if it's two people traveling, a family traveling, if they're traveling with animals, typically then their options are limited, which is why, you know, calling or you know, however you get in contact Smart. with the companies, you're providing a you know, much easier solution. Smart. Actually, funny enough, this is the only home in about a five block radius um, that has a yard. And so that yard keeps me occupied. Um, like it's well, not the prettiest house, it's all the houses kind of look like this, but you know, I'm in West Philly, but because I had a yard, I went into it knowing I wanted to be pet friendly. And so a lot of times, um, you know, people will advertise their properties as pet friendly, but there is no yard. So if you think, a, a traveling professional, whether they're a medical professional or just a busy professional, you want to be able to let your dog out in the back and not have to walk them, especially on the streets of Philly, any part of Philly, you know, at night. And so having that yard was huge. Um, it also, my prior life, I was in commercial real estate as um, an underwriter, as an asset manager. And so I used to always just study like seasonality. And so bought this in January where I know no one's moving to to uh, Philly in January. So bought it, you know, significantly under market, got a great deal, um, then obviously knew, same way um, no one's moving or relocating or traveling to uh, Philly in January. So, but then, you know, I expected like a month or two to get it up and going. Um, but um, yeah, that was it. No, so I bought it turnkey. Um, yeah, I bought it completely turnkey, you know, you said turnkey, um, but basically everything was done. It was a, someone who had flipped the home who was just sitting vacant, and the only costs were furnishing and decorating. How's the competition in midterm rentals? Every market's different. Philly would not recommend it um, because of the regulations. I would say any market that has short-term rental regulations how it's going to be harder competition in midterm because sometimes investors will buy short terms and not look at the regulations until it's furnished, until it's closed. And so that's when like, like me, I'll do consulting to those investors and investors are saying, oh my God, it's furnished. What's my next best option? Well, instead of sell it, it's midterm. Um, I would say that having a, a, a huge driver of midterm demand is key. So like when in Philly, I mentioned um, like the medical travelers. So they in Philly, there's two research hospitals, which research hospitals I learned are where like medical students are going essentially every month. They have new and different types of medical students um, who are coming in. And so like medical students, I can always get a medical student. One time I had a six week vacancy. No, I was like, oh, it was, it was kind of tight because I had someone coming in because I had a nurse cancel, was able to get an a optometry, um, she was studying optometry, her and a roommate, and they came in, they rotate in four-week increments. 
And so I would say if you have a huge driver, then you're really able to eliminate that. But unfortunately, it takes doing some research because there isn't one way to go and say, hey, this is you know, the demand, um, especially in midterm. They don't have as many as analytics as like short terms do. And then the second part of this is once you start seeing it, your reticular activator kicks in and values every single thing, you're like, okay, that would be good, that would be good, that would be good or not. I have friends in you know, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee is a great place right now to buy. It's cheap, they all need to be renovated, and you have a ton of college students there that don't have housing. Just the way it is. And so mom and dad are going to rent the spot, not the kid. You don't want the, the college kids per se, but like she said, the graduate students or, or whatever. As long as you can control the, the condition of the property, you're in much better shape. So. You know, Baltimore, maybe. Baltimore might be a good market. There's not the city. Not the city. Because the city has a regulation where you have to rent over 90 days for it to be considered a midterm. So just a note, not Baltimore. How about local? Like the Fairfax, Manassas Hospital, right? So you probably can speak, I can speak to Fairfax because I live in Fairfax County. Um, I midterm rent actually a bedroom in my home, in my primary home, and it covers um, my mortgage. Um, that works great because, well, when I cover my mortgage, you know, like me and my husband, we have a three bedroom, rent a room, it's great. But because it's a primary home, we don't have as many of those regulations because we're renting a home, like it's like a roommate, someone coming to stay. Now, actually right now we're converting our home into a, into a whole home. MTR, it's going to be a three bed, two bath condo. It's a lot harder because you have to rent it over 30 nights to be considered MTR, then I'm in an HOA, so the HOA requires 90 nights. And so we're actually just going to wait and live in it until someone books it, then we leave. So then we know it's going to be occupied. Um, and so I think it's a lot harder too because like Philly, $120,000, my PITI is eight eighty five. dollars It's a lot easier to cover that than a mortgage in, in Ruston. And so I think it's a lot harder. Now for me, and this is, I don't know the regulations in Loudoun County, but for midterm, I would say Ashburn or closer to those data centers because I get people all the time. And again, I have a room rented for, listed for rent and they're asking me about, hey, do you have anything for, I have crews coming in for data centers and rest in the Ashburn, um, you know, is a little far. So I think anything in there or near those large, large, you know, influencers of of demand, right? Like the data centers, they're building them more and more. So construction workers and all those different, um, you know, professions would have a huge influx of MTR travelers. Yep. Awesome. Oh, and real quick, there's also one in Reston. So in Reston, there's a, a government agency called, I may butcher the name, the U.S. Geological Spatial, am I saying that right? Yeah? Yeah, okay, so um, we housed an intern um, who, was, who was there, and she was telling us who essentially every three months they have this huge intern program where interns are saying no because they don't have places to live. I personally, me and my husband only wanted one traveler at a time in the home. Um, so, you know, we only were able to offer one room, but if someone's looking at maybe room rentals, especially for interns who are, they were all um, post-grad interns, so like before their, their graduate degree, so different than running to undergrads, but that's a different um, tenant avenue. I think it's available for uh, HOA. So on this one, oh, our, well, on mine, my HOA is a lot. I would say HOAs are hard because, like, one, financially, like, we just got hit with a $200 increase in our HOA. That's never fun. Um, so financially, you know, they can increase every year, which our has. Also, there's, def there's different rules and regulations. So I would not buy a property in an HOA to midterm rent. Like our property, we bought it a few years ago. We're looking to relocate. We, our furniture's already there. It's probably going to cost us three to five thousand just to get, you know, things, um, you know, change out the couch and maybe update it a bit. 
but it's not going to cost much to turn it to a midterm rental per se, where that's a lot different than buying a property that's in a HOA just to midterm rent. Because the problem is the, you know, the HOA and then also like the Karens, people who complain, <laughs> um, you know, can really get in your way. I think especially with midterm rentals, I've seen people who, let's say you're following the regulations, but a guest cancels, which, you know, their travel assignment cancels, you know, there's different things you can put in your lease, so you're compensated for that, but they cancel. Well, now they're not following the HOA rules, and so now someone tells on them. So technically, they only run it for six weeks, not three months, but that was out of their control. So HOAs can be like a huge factor, but like on the flip side, like with our condo, um, in our HOA, all utilities are included. So that's helpful for me because I'm able to really like know my costs because all utilities are included in that set, you know, HOA fee that probably will keep going up every every year, but at least it's going up a nominal percentage versus someone coming in and blasting the AC and my utility bill is going up a few hundred dollars. Because they're they're bringing in crews of one workers to work on them. Um, I think of workers more as like the engineers, the um, sometimes like even management teams where they're coming from a different location data center to set up this data center. Um, a cool thing is on Furnish Finder when you're in a market. So I'm in Reston. I get requests for pretty much from Loudoun County, County to Montgomery County. So because I'm a bit of an MTR nerd, I read all those requests just to understand why people are traveling. And like that's how I find out about like the, the internship program and like the data centers. Um, I think Rustin and Herndon, the, more, the most travelers I see are just people who are looking to move to Rustin or Herndon, have a family, it's too expensive to run a traditional Airbnb, and they can't stay in a hotel. That's, you know, which, not saying that's a bad demographic to rent to, but, um, you know, I think that pricing is less flexible because, you know, that person is more on a budget because they're saving up for, you know, for a home. Um, but you can work with realtors directly, you know, for that. And I'm sure, you know, it's a great um, source of leads. That I don't have um, properties that are kid-friendly and that are larger that support families, so that's not a demographic I've pursued, but that's something uh, to keep in mind, too. I saw another one. Question actually for both of you. Do you guys have a list of furnishings to buy? I do not, depending on the property, but I can tell you where to go. I do. <clears throat> actually, this um, QR code, I have a free MTR setup guide, and it'll take you to that, and I have all of that. Um, I buy Wayfair and Amazon level. We do too. Yes. So I think the only thing that I go, do you go like a bit higher up for your beds? Or you get or the beds, yes. The, well, yes. It's sheets, pillows, mattresses, mm -hmm. right? The bed itself, you can get almost anywhere you want. But if it matches the decor, so you're not going to buy a log cabin and put an iron bed in there. You're going to put a you know a theme type of scenario. So you can't necessarily buy that at Wayfair. Mm -hmm. But it's truly the cheapest place that you can get for the highest potential quality. And Wayfair is the greatest thing. We bought a four seat. I, for my mattresses, I get Helix mattresses. They're like kind of Marriott quality. I think with the midterm rental guests, it's different because they're there for months. And I know me, I have a bad back, so I want a more comfortable mattress. And I have gotten, you know, feedback on the mattress, good feedback, but I'm sure if it was bad, I'd get that as well. I use a site, this is for short or midterm, um, Host GPO. I don't know if anyone else is using it. Basically, you pay, I think it's 100 or 200 a year to be a member of Host GPO, and then you get significant discounts. Um, I, I actually just bought a King Helix mattress retail for about $1,300 for a little less than $400. So that's, and I bought it for my primary, but that's just how, you know, significant of a discount, you know, you can get, for especially for those 
higher quality furnishings like beds or if you want to go a little higher quality with your linens. Anyone else? By the way, there's services for all of this. So, for example, if you go to the website called SDR Cribs, they are a design company that will go in, furnish, help you set up, fix whatever's wrong, paint the walls and the murals, and do all the stuff. So, there's a, it's a, it's a thing for everything, right? If you don't want to pay for it, or you don't want to deal with it, here, SDR Cribs will do it. You just write the check, and then we'll send it up, and then you get a manager company or whatever you want. Yeah, I haven't used that, but that's that's a great yeah. tip. I see our groups. I don't know if you want to go back to the slides or you should. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually under contract and getting one now. Um, what they're doing is using um, kind of like a hybrid between the long term and the short term rate because for midterms on three bedrooms, there's $2,000 gaps. So there is no market rate. And so that's what, how my lender is doing it now. But it does qualify based on the long term rent, which is what I like to, you know, ensure anyway. So I think it's 1.2 is, is the DS, like minimum DSCR for the loan product I'm getting now, and so it cash flows, you know, it works as long term. Oh, so the rent covers, so the, the rent covers the mortgage price by 1.2 times or higher. So, And one of our sponsors that I mentioned earlier, Cherie Warwick, has a product that will do a DSCR and she will accept short term rental rates and midterm rental rates. So, and that happened? Yeah. Oh man. But it wasn't her. Yeah. Gotcha. The actual one. Okay. Now can we clap for uh, for Jamie? Woo! Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. All right. I have to do this weird double microphone thing because my lapel one died. All right. I'm just about done here, guys. We're just gonna run through these handful of MTR slides because I made them. Uh, so ideal midterm rental in investors. Uh, so obviously you've got corporate housing, you've got the relocating professionals, and this is going to be uh, better for people that want fewer turnovers, fewer tenants, right? Uh, some of the pros is that your, your income is going to be a bit more stable. You're going to have some less turnover, uh, less frequent guest interactions, because while they're there, they have a regular lease and they act kind of like they live there. More like a long Right. Uh, some of the cons is that um, it may be generally less income than, than short term rentals, though I guess Jamie kind of proved me wrong on hers. My, my God, 40, 4,500 a month when you paid 110, 120 for that? Jeez. That breaks the 1% rule. <laughs> no, I wish they were all like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you do have some less flexibility, obviously, because you're going to have the longer lease terms. Um, and you do need to be careful about. Um, the market saturation competition in some of the areas can be uh, high. I have a question for yeah. first of all. Um, in short-term rentals, depending on the area, you do have to sign a short-term rental lease, right? So not in Virginia, but there are certain areas that do that. Do you have an eviction problems, per se? I never have. Not you personally, but do you hear of that? I haven't, but I think especially 
a lot of people I'm working with are doing the B2B. Yeah. So it's just like. Yeah, so what I've heard, and I don't know, I haven't researched this before, but anything over 30 days, then, for example, in Fairfax County, you might have to deal with eviction law. Wait, do you send this to her department? I, she does, I don't. You don't. How do you send this to her department? Like, you can get this through the process. Yeah. And usually, how much is she doing in the department against her? Usually, a third. But I get a damage protection, which is similar to the short term rental. There's an insurance through Airbnb and others, but I, I have really good property insurance to cover some of that. And, you know, so I, it's just something to think about. Um, anything over 30 days, you might have eviction trouble. Awesome. Sorry. Quick question. How do you calculate the market? I know you said there's not one single metric, but how would you calculate the uh, market saturation for, for MTRs? Short Part. terms? Uh, medium, medium term. Um, there's a site called DPGO. It's just DPGO.com, I believe. And it gives you the, you put in your market, it's free. And it gives you the percentage of properties that are rented for over 30 days which essentially are the percentage of properties that are in I would say anything over 15% isn't good. So like in Philly right now, it's 35%. It was 8% when I invested. So that means one in every three properties on Airbnb is a, is a medium term rental, which isn't good because not one in three travelers are medium term travelers. That was so a good question. Like, in a, like I'm looking at Indianapolis right now, it's 6%. So I'm like, I'm very excited no regulation. So I would say take a look there. Um, and it, you know, it will change because it gives you like that point in time. So you, and one thing I do is monitor that just to see if my market is starting to get regulated. DPGO. Mm -hmm. There are um, a ton of websites out there. Facebook groups are insane with this amount of it. I mean, you can go almost anywhere you want and get a group that's got some kind of information about this subject. So if you don't know the answer or the website to go to or go to the, the groups that are out there and listen to the actual investors. We've already talked about that a hundred times over. You're not going to fix and flip something and you know it's not going to work, right? So go to an area that you know is going to work, start there, have success, and then find the next one and go on from that. Awesome. I would not personally invest in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Why not? It's a great place, right? They have cool houses, but everything's a million bucks and they're only bringing in $100,000, $110,000 a year. If I have one month that's bad, I've got a $7,000 mortgage payment, I'm in big trouble. Mm. Rough. Um, so, key tactics for efficiency in your <coughs> midterm rental business. Uh, you do want to have a really good relationship with how you're going to be sourcing your tenants. So choosing, are you going to go B to C, B to B, uh, figuring that out is going to be very important. You're going to optimize your furnishings, talking about Wayfair, making sure that whatever you're choosing is going to be appropriate for what you're doing. If you're going to be allowing pets, maybe you pick some furnishings that are going to be uh, less susceptible to the kind of wear and tear that pets are likely to bring. Uh, streamlining your leases, making sure that you have looked over that with someone who knows the kind of typical pitfalls that you might be running into so you're legally protected with the correct paperwork. Uh, having some flexible pricing because may have uh, a different daily rate, right? I'm sure Philly is going to be different than Indiana in terms of what you can charge, right? Uh, and then maintaining clear communication so that it's systematized with regular check-ins. Uh, they are not as high maintenance as short-term rentals, uh, but they are, I think, still a little bit more maintenance than a long-term rental. Maybe Jamie could add some insight into what communication with these tenants looks like.
based off credit cards and through the platform. So I don't get any direct payments unless I use my website and then we actually set up like a, like a square account or something like that so they can pay directly to that. So it's ready to the business bank account. So some of the common mistakes we see in midterm uh, rentals is going to be inadequate screening where you got to, again, thoroughly vet your tenants. That's a pretty consistent thing uh, with all real estate, really. Um, the bricks and mortar don't pay rent. <laughs> it's the person who you put in the building. Uh, and those are also the people who are taking care of your property. So making sure that you're uh, correctly vetting, especially if you're going through a platform like, um, help me, it's a, uh, no, Furnish Finder, right? If you go, that, cause that's more the budget people, right? Um, poor lease agreements, again, it's a common air issue. You don't want to just get a free download off the internet. You want to make sure you're getting something that has been vetted. Uh, and then, of course, neglecting maintenance. Uh, th these are furnished properties, so you do want to get an eye on the furnishings because if you go in there and stuff's broken and you didn't know about it, that's going to be an issue. Um, yeah, so if somebody breaks a lamp in our house, we're not giving them a ton of crap. To be honest with you, it's not worth the time. We're still getting the lamp. It costs us five bucks. Move on. What's it like for midterm? So what I did is the damage protection policy that you can get. They're usually traditionally structured for short term. Awesome. Um, so I like doing both, which some people call it an overkill, but I'm able to get like the sheet. I know after nine months, the sheets aren't. I need to replace the sheet. Yeah. 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 So some other unique things that you might want to consider for your midterm rental business is rentals. Uh, I've definitely seen some people out there do some really cool things with, um, oh gosh, now I forgot the name, Turo, Turo thank you, Turo, where, um, you know, these people are going to be in town for a few, for a little while, they're going to need a car. If you already have that presented as a convenience option for them, they may just take you up on it. Um, another option uh, would be customizing your living spaces. You know, some people, if you've got a two-bedroom, uh, they don't need both bedrooms for people. They might just want to have a bedroom and an office. And so being able to swap what's in there or have the space uh, maybe with a Murphy bed or something that allows you to customize it like that could be attractive for different uh, people for different reasons. So thinking about that. And final tip on the subject before we wrap it up today is going to be considering hybridizing both strategies. Uh, there's a lot of seasonality in these businesses, and so we do see people have success by using term rental during the off-peak season uh, in order to add some stability, and then switching back to short-term rental uh, to get those peak rates for the highest demand months. Uh, try to maximize your occupancy this way, and some of the drawbacks you might want to consider is that managing two different rental modes can uh, complicate your operations. So if you're hiring a manager, this has to be something they can accommodate. And if they can't accommodate that, then this may not be the option where you're, you're going to have to find your own manager or self-manage, right? It also depends on the market. So, for example, you mentioned Lake Anna. Right? Mm -hmm. What's the market that everybody wants to rent short term? Spring through fall, right? So then, at that moment, then, say, October 30th hits, I then pull in a midterm renter till the spring to cover all the other expenses until then, right? While somebody's building a house in the area or whatever, the case may be. you see this all the time in Lake Community, Ship, Smith Mountain Lake, Lake Anna. You also see it in Northern Neck, you know, so summertime is great, winter time is terrible, right? So then you're gonna put somebody that just wants to have a space. The very first month on our very first uh, short-term rental property, we had a guy writing a book and he reached out to us while we were still working up the kinks. He was a friend of ours and he was writing a book in that property, paid us three grand for the month, which wasn't even going to cover our expenses, but it got us 
there, and then he, because he was a friend of ours, worked out the kinks. And what happens with the water when it can this, this, and this, and so that we can fix the problem before it became a bigger issue. Thanks. Okay, I think that we're just about done. Feel free to join us on all the different social media stuff. Please give us a kind review so we can grow this community. Uh, we need to be out of here by 8, 8.30. So try to be gone around 8. If it's 8.30 and you're still here, they're going to like So don't <laughs> be here after. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> No, um, and uh, please invite people to join you, come back, uh, come back again, bring friends, and um